thank you for taking the time to attend tonight's police commission gathering to provide your input into what you believe that we, the Los Angeles Police Department, that what you believe the Los Angeles Police Department policy governing the use of on-body cameras should contain. The first item of business is any comments from my fellow commissioners. Commissioner Figueroa, Vila? Okay. Um, Speak uh, right I'm Kathleen Kim. I, I look forward to hearing your thoughts on, on body cameras, and I can assure you that um, all of us up here will take it very seriously as we evaluate um, the protocol for the use of them within the LAPD. Thanks. I would now like to introduce one of uh, my favorite Stanford University grads, uh, Councilmember Current Price, Current Price, for a few comments. Welcome, Councilman. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, to the commissioners, uh, to the chief, uh, and uh, LAPD and the community. It really is an honor uh, to be with you this evening. Uh, and I think it's significant that uh, uh, one of the first public meetings on the cameras uh, is going to be here uh, in the 9th District. Uh, I was certainly uh, uh, very supportive of that effort. Uh, it, it was a motion that I made, uh, and so I think it's very timely that these cameras are going to be rolled out in Newton, as I understand, uh, and parts of the South L.A. Uh, our country and our city are at critical points in time when it relates to policing in our communities, and especially communities of color. Painful circumstances uh, have led to justifiable frustration and concern, especially among relations between young men of color uh, and our law enforcement. Being a man of color myself, I understand the importance of ensuring everyone understands that all lives matter. But today it's about increasing accountability and transparency so that we can continue to build trust. Uh, and I truly believe that L.A. Is, has the most elite, uh, the most sensitive police department uh, in our country uh, and officers who really want to make a difference and improve our community. And so a citywide program for body cameras is going to protect the community, I think, as well as the officers uh, who wear them. It's also going to help us gain answers in situations when information and eyewitness testimony is scarce. Uh, my constituents in South L.A. have demanded answers uh, in, in the past several weeks about events uh, that have had to be painstakingly reconstructed uh, through the officers' accounts and witness accounts. Body cameras, uh, we believe, will help alleviate the high burden of proof that we need to ensure that justice always prevails. Uh, so we're living in a world where cameras are everywhere, and so why shouldn't we equip our officers with the latest technology? Uh, it's my hope that after this evening, we're going to all leave here uh, better with a better understanding of, of this technology, how it's going to impact uh, our community, and assisting uh, the department uh, that's committed to protecting and serve us uh, become real partners with us in our community. So again, I thank you for your time. I look forward to uh, the comments from our community. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Again, I want to thank every single person for coming here. I want to um, encourage um, a whole bunch of you that I've talked to already in four or five years when you're old enough to apply to be LAPD officers because we need a lot of great officers and uh, we need people to uh, to make uh, make changes from the inside in a, in a in a positive way and we look forward to that. So let me tell you the big before I talk about the background of how we got here and what we're doing here tonight. Let me talk to you about the big vision and draw the circle. These cameras work. The cameras work. They've been in other communities and worked. Um, they've been in other countries and worked. Uh, in, some, uh, in some communities, the results are um, astounding. By astounding, um, 80, over 80% 80 reduction in officer-related complaints. In other communities, in, a, uh, in other communities, over 60% less use of forces by officers. If we were to have a third of those results here in Los Angeles, in a big city, a th a, a, the reduction of complaints, a reduction of use of force, what happens? 
lives are saved. Substantial dollars and time are saved. People who aren't going to be happy are the lawyers um, and, uh, uh, and the litigators. But s settlements will go down. The amount of litigation will go down. The amount of overtime that these good officers have to, have to use to, to spend their time um, uh, when there's additional evidence like this, which will make things faster. So let's, uh, so the potential for um, savings in lives and in money is, is huge, it's transformative. Where should that money go instead of in settlements and in litigation? I can think of two places right here. One is it should go into the communities. It should go into programs in the communities. Programs for education, programs for jobs, programs for opportunities, programs for sports, programs for culture. So kids aren't out just walking around the streets uh, in, the, in, uh, in the middle of the night or the middle of the day. Let's surround kids around America with opportunities. That's a good place to spend money. Let me tell you another good place to spend some of this money. Let's pay officers what they deserve to be paid. Let's increase the salaries of officers and incentivize officers and through appreciation. So I have a big vision and a big hope for these cameras. So let me tell you the background of how we got here and where we are this evening. In August of 2013, so I don't know how many months ago that was, 15 months ago, when appointed to the police commission by Mayor Garcetti, I don't know what you guys did. I think you did pretty much the same thing. But I called a whole bunch of people saying, well, if I'm going to do this job, how am I going to do a good job? What should I do? Give me your constructive criticism. Tell me what needs to be done. So I called uh, 30 people. I got 29 return calls. And my question was, what should, be, what should happen? What do you think are the important issues? And over and over again, I talked to um, civil rights leaders, civic leaders, community leaders, police officers, ACLU, police protective, asking them all this, what can, and in their fave five, and everybody's fave five, was on body cameras. I said, geez, I've got to look into that. I've got to look into that. So I was surprised to hear how virtually everyone wanted officer, on officer cameras, even if they wanted them for different reasons. Some people want them solely for the protection of the public. Some people want them solely for the protection of the police officers. But they all want them. So we focused on the potential value of this emerging technology from both sides of the camera. And at the same time, let's get real, cities have financial issues, and there was not money in the budget to do this. So we thought, why don't we go to the, to the private community and see about people who, uh, um, go to people who, who care about the city and people who care about police officers and who care about the public and see if we can't, just can't raise the money that way to get a kickstart on this program, which we did. Um, the technology will provide an independent view of the interaction or action that a police officer has with a community member. And with that, a significant community fundraising effort, I told you, was launched. About a million six was raised from private sources and donated to the Police Foundation. Then the department did an independent pilot project, took a number of different cameras on a number of different officers in a number of di different situations and selected what they thought would be best. It covers, uh, the money covered about 800 and some, uh, 800 and some cameras. You'll hear more about the testing and selection process in a few moments with Dan Gomez. Then something really horrible happened. The events of Ferguson. And some of the events that were here um, that we all think about all the time. But after, those, after the events in Ferguson, the family of Michael Brown, from the depth of their grief, 
from the sorrow and the whatever emotions of anger or disappointment they felt, called for on-body cameras for every law enforcement America, in America. Then the President of the United States did the same thing. And then our mayor said, you know, 800 is not enough. We have 10,000 officers. We need 7,000 of these cameras. So the mayor has, um, has committed with the help of the council to purchase another 7,000 units. In, the, in Los Angeles, we have had incidents of use of force as recently as the officer involved shooting of Mr. Ezell Ford that have occurred where the video from an on-body camera would be really important additional information in an investigation, in an investigation. Equally as important, if not more important, these cameras have been shown to de-escalate situations so they don't happen in the first place. When people know they're being filmed, they act differently. And people are, when people know that the um, officers act differently and people on the other side of the camera act differently, a whole lot of things won't escalate. As you look at these incidents, a lot of times they don't start out to be where they wind up. They escalate. They get out of control. So Mayor Garcetti uh, announced in December that he was including in his budget right away for fiscal year 2015, July 15, sufficient funding to buy these additional cameras. On behalf of my colleagues, I want to thank Councilman Curran Price and many of the council members for their support of this important project. This is happening. But, mark our words, not one camera will be used until two things happen. Number one is that the officer is trained in using the camera. And number two, the policy in which the officers will be trained has been approved in its final form by the police commission. Before the police commission does that, we will receive a draft of the policy. We haven't seen it yet. They're still gathering information and hope to gather a bunch of it tonight. And then we will, we will have a public meeting um, during, uh, during police commission before the policy is adopted. I promise you, not everyone is going to be 100% happy with the policy. It can't happen because you have people that are for the cameras for different reasons. Is that a reason not to do it? No. The department is in the process of developing a draft of the policy and has sought community input through a number of small focus groups. The use of an online survey, which can be found on our website, LAPD Online, and we also have available tonight at the back of the room a document with a number of questions which you can write your responses and submit one of the, to one of our officers in attendance. We have sent to over 1,000 individuals this survey who have provided their email address to the commission to receive various messages. People have been phoning in, they've been emailing in, they've been coming to our police commission meetings and giving us their input for questions, things that they would like to see covered in a policy. The draft policy, when it's completed early next week, because you didn't, we didn't, the policy didn't, couldn't be completed until we get your input, will then be presented to the Police Protective League for a required meet and confer process. After the completion of that process, the final policy will be presented to the police commission. I wanted to say, I also want to say the ACLU um, has been working, uh, Maggie will, will talk about some of the stakeholders you've already been working with in formulating the policy. Then the final policy will be presented to the police commission for the final, for, for final approval. At that time, before we approve it, the public will have opportunity to review, make comments on the final policy prior to our approval. So tonight, you're first going to receive, it's going to be cool tonight, you're going to receive an introduction as to what the department views is the benefit of the camera to the department and to the public. 
That introduction will be provided by our Chief of Police, Charlie Beck. Next, Sergeant Dan Gomez will provide you with a demonstration of the on-body camera, the field testing and selection process, and explain a number of the anticipated policies regarding the operation of the camera. Once that is completed, we'll take public comment. If you wish to speak, please fill out a speaker card, which is available at the back of the room or, or, from, or from one of the officers. If you wish to speak, speak at the microphone. Do not speak from your seats, because we can't hear you. It's not fair to the other people who are sitting next to you, and it's not fair to us because we, it's, it's all garbled. So when you speak, speak at the microphone. If you wish to speak, fill out a speaker card, which is available at the back of the room or from one of the officers. When your name is called, come to the microphone, provide your comments, and ask any questions. In order to not interrupt you as you're making your comments or asking your questions, we're going to keep track of the questions. And at the conclusion of the comment, Sergeant Gomez or a member of the commission will answer your question. We're not going to answer them as they come up. We're going to take notes because many people may ask the same question, et cetera, et cetera. We're trying to be respectful of your time. Managing the meeting in this manner will ensure that we can hear your comments and questions without interruption, and you can get your question answered, and we can all leave at a reasonable hour. Some of what we would like to hear your thoughts on are, when should the officers turn the camera on? Under what circumstances should they turn them off? Should officers tell individuals they are being recorded? Should all interactions with the public be recorded? All interactions. Are there cases or locations where you believe recordings should not take place? How should the LAPD protect the privacy of the individuals who are recorded on the video? Do you believe officers should be able to view the video prior to the writing of the necessary reports? Do you believe the department supervisors should regularly review the video captured to ascertain opportunities for training? And what other questions do you think we should be asking of the people who are writing the policy? With that, let's begin. Remember, adhere to the two minutes, and when you hear the timer, your time is concluded. If you have a speech that you are reading and you want someone else to finish after your two minutes, hand your speech to someone else so we can hear your whole speech. Thank you. Chief Beck, would you please provide your comments and introduce Sergeant Dan Gomez. Please. Thank you, Mr. Sobroff. Uh, first, uh, thank you all for participating in this. This is a really important piece of the decisions that the Commission and I need to make in the deployment of body cameras. These cameras are designed and intended to build public trust. Therefore, it's extremely important to hear from you on what you think should be the parameters under which we use these. The primary purpose of tonight is to hear from you, so I'm going to keep my comments very brief. Luckily, President Sobroff has covered most of the ground, and Dan Gomez, who will do a demonstration of the, of the technology and also talk about some of its potentials and some of its limitations, will fill in many of the blanks for you. But what I want to stress is that this is about accountability, and accountability occurs on both sides of the camera. It's important that this police department be accountable to the people it serves. It's important that we do the right thing and that we can demonstrate it as well as humanly possible. And that's what the cameras are about. Building trust, making us more effective at what we do. They're a fantastic evidence collection tool. But remember, evidence works both ways. It convicts, but it also exonerates. And these cameras will do both. The commissioner is absolutely right. People act better when they're on camera. And I think that's important. Civility and in police interactions, the way we treat people, is extremely important to me. This will be an effective tool in that. 
and I want to give you a chance to talk, so I'm going to bring up Sergeant Dan Gomez. Sergeant Gomez was one of the original designers of our in-car video system. Uh, he also helped design the camera system that was originally put in MacArthur Park. Uh, he has been all over this country talking to police departments and sheriff's departments that have already implemented on-body cameras. He's also on the president's commission regarding the use of body cameras. He's a really knowledgeable person on this subject, and he has been at the forefront in designing not only the system that we're using, but how we're going to use it. So, Dan, with that, I'll give you a, I'll give you the, the floor. Thank you, Chief. Commissioner, Chief, thank you for having me. Uh, don't mind, I'm going to turn my back to you so I can address yeah. the public. Can you speak in the microphone there, Dan, so that you... Okay, thank you. So, I am uh, wearing the body cameras on the center of my chest here. As you can see it, it's nice and high. It's uh, designed so it can capture about a 130-degree angle from the camera. Uh, if you notice, you'll see a little bit of orange that's on the uh, camera itself. That camera means that it's on. So that's the indicator both to the supervisors and to the public that the system is actually on. Um, we did an extensive testing process on several different manufacturers, several different styles of body cameras, both from a technology standpoint and from a field operation standpoint. And what that means is my staff that worked for me, we looked at if the vendor said that it did a particular thing, if it was supposed to last a certain amount of time in terms of battery power, we tested it to verify in fact that it did that. If it was supposed to record a certain amount of video, we ran it that entire time to make sure that, in fact, it did that. The field officers used it in terms of practicality. Was it easy to use? Did it interfere with them doing their job? Um, was it intuitive? Was the system easy to use once they took it back and they need to review video and write reports? They were critical in this process because, again, they gave us the information live as it was happening, and we used the same set of officers to compare the different devices. So we ensured we got the best quality feedback that we could. In addition to that, we, we worked directly with the manufacturers. Um, we made sure that we understood what kind of parts were going into the devices, the quality, what kind of support, and what the overall system would do for the department. Because again, the cameras are one part of it. The policy is, is certainly a large part of it, but there's also the support side of it. We needed companies that were gonna be there to help us 24 seven. They were gonna make sure that um, all the video quality reached evidentiary type value. We wanted to make sure that we were partnering with the company Again, that would be there for the long haul because this is a substantial investment by the city, by the community, everybody's time. We want to make sure we had a good partner throughout the process. So going back to the camera that I'm wearing, um, one of the reasons we selected it is because, uh, quite frankly, I don't even feel that I'm wearing it. It sits on, on my chest right here on, on top of my vest. It's very, very light. It's very simple to operate. When I turn on the camera, I simply push the button in the center twice. You should have heard two beeps. Hopefully the microphone picked that up. That means the mic the video is recording. So right now, all the video here, uh, me talking, you looking at me, is all being recorded. The audio is being recorded. It uses standard definition for the tech folks out there. It's a very good quality video. Um, the audio is very good. And the other thing that we liked about this particular system is because it's a little wider, it sits on my chest and it's very stable. So as I move around or as I do the normal functions of police work, it's, it, the camera is very steady. That's important when you're reviewing the video for evidence or to look at uh, writing reports. Um, if anybody's ever seen the movie The Blair Witch Project and it's moving around, you can almost get your car sick. So you have to look <laughs> away when you look at it. So we're very pleased at the quality of the video. So this entire time I've been recording, but a unique thing happened when I started this uh, recording. Another reason we selected this device is it goes back 30 seconds in time. So the entire time I was up here explaining the process, I was actually recording in what we call a buffer mode. So when I pressed the button, it went back and caught those 30 seconds. There's no audio involved in that, but there is the video, and that's important because you can, you can see what happens. And the example I like to give is for instance, if I was working in a car, me and my partner, and I saw someone run a stop sign. When I see them run a stop sign, I press the start button. Now 
I'm going to take action. I'm going to pull someone over, and I may give them a citation or a warning, whatever appropriate. But the fact is, I started it after the incident occurred. So in most systems, we wouldn't have caught that violation. Because this system goes back 30 seconds, if I do it within that window, I'm going to catch that violation. When I go to review the video, I'm actually going to see the person or the vehicle going through that stop sign, and I'll have captured that. That's really unique to this particular device, and there's a few of them on the market that do that. So that's one of the reasons we thought it was important that, this, uh, that we selected this particular manufacturer. Right now, you just heard a beep. About two minutes into my recording, which is how long I've now been talking, it gives me a reminder. A reminder both to the citizen and to me that the camera is still on. So I know that it's working properly, that it's functioning, and it's continuing to record. When I'm ready to stop recording, it's not just to touch the button, it's a deliberate press and hold. So I have to press and hold the button for about four seconds. That long beep that you heard now tells me and the person I'm talking to that the actual video has turned off. It's now stopped. So now I'm no longer recording uh, video and audio, but the system has reset itself. So now I'm going back to that 30 seconds over and over again, waiting for me to turn it back on. It's one of the things we liked about the system. It's very simple. It allows me to keep my hands in front of me. It allows me to interact with you. It's not, I'm not fumbling for it. It's very easy to find. The button's very big, right in the center. Another reason we like the system is it's very sturdy, as I mentioned, on my uniform and on my chest. But as I, pardon me just a second, as I slide it off, it's in this protective holder. This protective holder we like. We've done a lot of testing. We've done a lot of chasing. We've done a lot of rustling, um, a lot of uh, tactics with it. And as I shake the device, it's not falling out. So that's one of the things we liked about it is that it was durable and it wouldn't just fall out easily. That's another reason we liked it. I'd like to talk a little bit about the security of the device, is as I take it out of its holder, the device is completely sealed. A couple reasons for that. One is uh, it obviously protects it from the elements, so it can be raining, it can be cold, um, hopefully it doesn't snow in LA. If it snows, there's another issue, but the, the fact is, is that it's, it's very, very durable, it's weather resistant, so we're very happy about that. The other thing about the device itself is that because it's completely sealed, I have no access to it. I don't have access to the battery. I don't have access to the internal memory of it. I can't get to it. I can't take it away. I can't erase it. I can't alter it, delete it, or do anything to the, the video that's captured on this. The only way to get it out is when I go back to the docking station um, at the police station is I have to insert that, and I'll cover that in a minute. I want to continue to talk about security. As I mentioned, because it's completely sealed, uh, anything that's recorded, um, it, is, uh, it gets what's called a hashtag, meaning that all the video is uh, given a unique identifying number. So once I'm done and I go to upload it, that number has to match as it transfers over. If it doesn't match, the system won't allow it to come off the system. That's how one of the ways it does it, what's called an integrity check on the system. It makes sure that the video is exactly as I recorded, exactly as it goes into the system. For the officer, again, it's very easy. Once you go back to the station, the officer simply slides it off. We're going to have docking stations that the officers go up to. They simply drop it in. There's a hole at the top of this. That makes a positive connection into our docking station. Once it's inside, the system does a couple things. It connects to our evidence.com account, which is a cloud storage account. And that creates uh, one is that's uh, very common. Anybody who has a smartphone here probably is using some sort of cloud service to back up their family photos, their pictures, all those things. Very similar in terms of this. Once we dock it, all our data, it does that handshake. It ensures that this device belongs to the Los Angeles Police Department and is ready to be uploaded to evidence.com. Once it finds that handshake and agrees, the data automatically comes off of this. The officers have done nothing at this point. All they've done is inserted it and walked away to write their reports. The, the system will then take all the video offline and it's stored into our evidence.com and it's stored for a minimum of two years. That's the city requirement for all evidence that's stored, a minimum of two years. Of course, if there's some pending litigation or there's some other reason that the uh, evidence should be stored in an ongoing investigation, it can be stored indefinitely. And that's how we do in-car video. That's how we're also going to do body cameras. But for minimum it's two years. While it's in that charging station it also does a couple other things. 
Very simply, it charges us back up. It makes sure that when the officer takes it back out, and each one of these is assigned to an individual officer. That's very important as well because they are accountable for this device. Um, this is theirs every day. If it doesn't work, they have to explain why their device isn't working. If it didn't turn on, they have to explain why it didn't turn on and what process they took to remedy that. That is all going to be things that are in our policy because they have to go out with a working body camera. That's going to be the policy um, that we're working on that's in there today. So, and that's what we hope the commission will approve. In addition to that, so I mentioned that it's charging. It's also getting any updates. Just like your phone, you get a little update from Android or for Apple says, hey, I have a new update. Would you like to download? This one doesn't ask the officer. If there's an update, it automatically happens when they put it in that cradle. So it stays current at all time. And then myself as an administrator of the system, I see all those updates. I know what's being fixed and why. And again, that relationship with the, uh, with the vendor is very important because I get those uh, in advance. The other thing it does while it's in there, and again, this is all happening simultaneously, is that the time is synced. So every time they put it in, it validates that it has the correct date and time, um, and that's synced to the GPS uh, atomic clock, and make sure that the devices are synced correctly. So if you have multiple officers at a scene, eventually when we pull all that video, we can look at that timeline and see when officers arrived, what they did, when they did it. That's very helpful, both from a community standpoint, from the officer standpoint, and certainly from the commission standpoint during any, any type of investigation. So all that has happened simultaneously. When the officer drops that in there, let's just say they get another call and they have to run out in order to help on a backup or help to a community call. If it's in the middle of their upload process and they pull it out of that docking station, it does not matter. The system says, hey, I did not do that handshake. I did not verify that it was done. No video will be erased off of this. It will, they can get it, stick it back in their holder and go right back to work and turn it on as uh, per policy. Not a problem. When they come back, they drop it back in. It picks up where it left off. It says, okay, I didn't get that other video. I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna take it all. I'm gonna make sure it securely goes over. It completely goes into the system. Once it does that and it verifies it, then it'll erase it off of this device because now the original resides in evidence.com. The officer, once it's in evidence.com, has the right to view it. They can log into it, but they have to do that with their credential. And as an officer, you can only see the video that you created. You can't see your partners, you can't see someone else just because you want to see it. You, it's a need to know, right to know. The officers have the right to only see their video. Me as a supervisor, I want to ensure that my officer is doing a good job, that they're complying with the policy. I may have to investigate something. So I want to make sure that uh, all supervisors have access to the video. They can review it. They can watch it. They have access to everybody's uh, video. And that's a good check and balance system that we have. Nobody, nobody in the department, not even the chief of police, can delete a video. So it takes the police commission to approve the deletion of video. There's a process for that. Once that uh, process is approved, and that can only be after that two year that I mentioned, um, it has to then go to our CIO who then approves it. And it's a two step process for me and the, the chief information officer for the department for us to actually delete it. So again, it's multiple layers of, of checks and balances before anything gets taken off the system. All the video can be shared uh, with the courts. Uh, if we have to produce something for a uh, civil or criminal court, we can certainly do that. When we do that, we do it in an original form. It is essentially just like getting an original. We produce that as the law requires. The system, again, is very, very easy to use. Um, once the officer comes back to work the next day or the next shift, they simply pull it out. They slide it right back into their holder that I was uh, showing you earlier. They slide it in, they stick it back on their uniform like this, and now they're ready to go to work. One last thing I want to show you is that each device comes with this device here, which uh, looks very similar to a cell phone. It is not a cell phone, it looks like one, it doesn't have any cell capability, but what it does is that it pairs with the body camera and that allows the officers to do a couple things one is when they're getting ready to go out um, to work that day they have to make sure that their device is working it's part of their checks that we're recommending in the policy they have to make sure that the system operates is fully functional so that if they capture video out there they actually have it uh, on their device what they can do is they pair through bluetooth so no 
data, no video is stored on this at all. All that's on here is that connection. It allows them to view it on this device, take a look at it, and say, yes, I can see what's happening in front of me, and my system is working. When they create a video, it allows them to add data to it. So for instance, I gave you that example of that traffic stop. So where someone runs the light. Once they run that light uh, and I go back to review it, I can say, I need to tell my supervisor that that's what it was. It was a traffic stop. So I have a drop down menu on here. I select traffic stop. And once I upload it, that data goes with me. And I can do that during my shift. The officers in the trial in Central Division, they really like that because what it did is allowed them to be productive during their shift. They didn't have to wait till the very end of their shift to add all this data. That's important because there's a reduction of overtime. The officers simply can do it as they go. But if for whatever reason they're very busy during their shift and they don't have the ability to do that, once they upload it and they log into the computer, again, with their personal password, they can add the data there. So again, they can add data to it, they can add information to it, and that's just words on a, on a computer. They can add to it, but they cannot delete, they cannot alter, they cannot change the video in any way, shape, or form. Um, so that's another reason the officers like this. Um, the uh, live preview, I know it's going to be very hard for you to see, but this, uh, this video is um, what is being transmitted, what my camera can see. So I'm going to walk just down the, the aisle here so you can see it. As I walk around, you can see the video. So that is the basics of the system. Again, the reason uh, we ultimately selected and made the recommendation for this particular one are for all those reasons that I've given you. And I look forward to your questions. I look forward to answering any technical questions that you have after the, the uh, public comment. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Okay, are we, are, are we ready to begin the questions? We are, sir. Okay, do we have uh, speaker cards? And again, I want to remind you that um, um, uh, two, uh, two minutes is the limit. If you have a speech that you want to give as an organization, whether it's eight minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes, just get 10 of your people to read it in segments, so that way we can treat everyone fairly. And, uh, and the speaking needs to come from the microphone. Um, because it won't come from up here or for uh, the people you're sitting next to. And then um, allow us to take notes so at the end we can answer questions um, and bring in people to give their opinions, um, which would help us because we might have two different opinions of one, of one question. So thank you for helping us. Let's begin. Mr. President, we have, one, we have one item, one speaker for item number three. And that is Tut Hayes. Where is Hollywood? Widescreen TV, 60 inches, 72 inches, some as wide as this wall. If they were going to show you how these cameras work, they would set up a widescreen TV and you would see how they work. There are two film schools in the city, USC, UCLA. Some kid would show you a reenactment for their studies. What happens when the officer's cheek to cheek with a guy he's struggling with, or a woman he's struggling with, when they have the dance of destruction? When 130 degrees won't do when you're this close, it won't work. But we need to see that. We need to see a demonstration of all the kind of situations which might be dangerous, displayed, recreation, reenactment. We've seen 2020. We know what um, um, uh, 48 hours is like. They do reenactments. We need to see a reenactment of what will happen on all the various conditions that officers are confronted with. Can we see that on camera? I can assure you, if this officer had been standing here now with that camera and I stepped up a foot from him, he would not see my face. Hear what I have to say and not see what I have to say. Ladies and gentlemen, if they don't show you in a demonstration of what kind of things we're concerned about, 
Is the officer gun really being reached for? Does the camera show that? Is the officer on top or is the victim on top? Does the camera show that? Of course not. So I would suggest you go back, do some performance, some guerrilla theater, and come out here and show us a demonstration of what would happen under these perilous events that we are concerned with. Don't you think that makes sense for all those Hollywood residents? Yeah, I think it's a, you know. Um, next. Um, I think that is a good, I think it's a good question. So I did go to the internet and I've looked and I've seen dozens of examples of how the cameras have operated under dozens of circumstances and I think you might want to do the same. Next. We have 30 public speaker cards. I will call the first three names and if you can make your way to the public microphone in the center aisle, please. The first is Dr. Perry Crouch. Sal Shama and Jerry Dietrich. Uh, first, give an honor to God who's the head of my life. Uh, Chief Beck, thank you. Thank you, Police Commissioner, President, Mr. Suvara, uh, uh, for listening to, to community leaders. I've been on this battlefield for 30 years, and I've seen it all from the Watts riot to the, to the, in 65 and in 92. And we've always asked for accountability. And thank you, Chief Beck, you listen. And this is a way that we can get to the bottom of a lot of issues in the community. Because a lot of times when we run into uh, conflict with law enforcement and we don't have no way of instant replay, we always come up on the short end. This way is giving us, and y'all uh, are putting it on the line, letting us know, okay, we, we're willing to, 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 to play ball. So I commend y'all. Uh, I, I, I was there Monday and a demonstration, and I asked all the questions that could be asked, and um, I'm just saying, I'm looking forward. This way, it, it keeps us in check, and then keeps also the officers in check, so if you want to act a fool, you're going to be recorded on both ends. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Marion Sundu, Catherine Wagner, Terry Williams, Welcome, sir. Thank you. Um, I would like to say thank you just um, to everybody. I know you guys have probably worked hard on this issue, but um, and somebody who just wants to speak on kind of the way I see it. Try and um, get as close to the mic as you can, because it's hard for us to hear. No problem. I think my opinion is in absence of real human change, what we're being given is technology helping to change this. And um, something that I heard for the first time is something that the congressman, that the, that the councilman said, which is about justice. And that's kind of what my comments are about. Um, I think we need to concentrate on justice and not just cameras. How would this affect the family if an incident happens? Will they get access to the camera footage 24, 48 hours, 72 hours after an incident? I think that would help because that this level of transparency is a lot of the time what the problem is. Families can't get the information needed when an incident happens and they feel like they're being stonewalled and the idea that the, the police are doing something conspiratorial is something that needs to be addressed or, 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 or problematic. Um, also, and this, it, this one's painful because it, it leads people to believe that the police are doing something wrong. In the, in the LA Times, they said that some police officers disabled cameras. That is hugely detrimental, and I would like to find out what the punishment is for officers who either don't activate their cameras and an incident happens or something else. Um, also, uh, my time's winding, winding down, so I'll, I'll leave some of the other comments. But I, I'm writing, so. Gotcha. <laughs> um, I have to make a, an appeal, which is because a lot of this has to do with me and people who are my age and my color, which is that what cameras I don't think do is that they don't solve, they don't stop or show that 
they don't stop a misunderstanding between me and a police officer that ends in a police officer killing me. It allows my family to watch a tape of me dying, and that is crushing. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good, good input. Welcome. Hello, my name is Jerry Dietrich, and I came here because I wanted to tell you all the terrible things that I think about these cameras and how I don't want them to happen. It seems to me it's a done deal. You guys are going to do it. And now you're wanting ways of how we can do it wonderfully. And I think it's technology. I mean, it's you're asking for, you're, your question is, can, how can we get trust between the police and the humans, the community, I mean? You treat the community like humans, they'll treat you like humans. You know, trust is a two-way street. You want to get trust, you've got to give trust. And it doesn't matter how many cameras you have or how much technology you have, if you treat people like garbage, they're going to react. Welcome, sir. Hello, how you doing today? My name is Teru Williams. Drew, can you speak a li little closer to the mic for us? Uh, my you. name is Teru Williams, and um, I'm a, a resident of uh, L.A. Um, from Watts, California. And... Um, uh, I have been, I got shot by the police. I've been shot in my back. And um, unfortunately, I, I would think that in theory that the police camera would help. But in reality, I don't think it really would help because uh, like he just, my, uh, people have stated before that, you know, that, you know, that police have covered the uh, camera in certain circumstances. And it's just that certain, in certain incidents that, um, where the, uh, I guess the evidence comes up missing or they don't use the evidence. It's only for the police benefit or for the court's benefit. It's not for the community's benefit. And that's not, that's not where I'm definitely against that. At first, I was for the cameras. Like for, like in my instance, I would think it probably would have helped, but I think I probably would have got shot anyway. So that doesn't really matter if you had a camera or not. I still would have got shot. That doesn't stop from people being killed. We need to stop people being and brutalized and um, that's what I have to say about that um, there's got to be other ways there's got to be alternatives besides cameras there's got to be uh, a commit uh, I mean a commitment from the uh, community to help oversee uh, some of the police actions that's going on in our community maybe we can uh, you know I guess the witnesses, like I had witnesses in my case that, you know, they didn't come forward, maybe because they're being harassed or, you know, they, they feared to come out and speak in my behalf. And unfortunately, if they can't do that in a human's perspective, so how could a camera help me in the same situation? And I just don't see how that can happen. Okay, so, you, so your question, which I think is a good one, um, that I wrote down, tell me if I'm wrong. I said, what are other things other than cameras that can uh, that need to happen with the trust. Yeah, other is, is that, the, is that, yeah, is is that, that your good. question? That's good. Okay, good. Next. Are you Catherine Wagner? Huh? Catherine Wagner, Marion Sundu. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Catherine Wagner. I'm an attorney with the ACLU of Southern California. The ACLU believes that body cameras are not a panacea, but they have the potential to significantly improve accountability and transparency, deter misconduct, and promote trust. But they're only tools, and if they're not used correctly, they can do little to help and may undermine the values they're supposed to serve. The ACLU will be submitting a more detailed written comment, but I'll highlight four key issues here. First, officers involved in shootings and other critical incidents should not be permitted to review body cam footage before giving an initial statement. This would, at the least, create the perception that officers can tailor their accounts of the evidence, undermining confidence in the investigation and the accountability that the cameras are meant to promote. It's bad policy and it must change. Chief Beck justified LAPD's withholding of the Ezel Ford autopsy on grounds that he didn't want to taint witness testimony. The same reasoning applies to officer testimony with video evidence. Second, public access to video is crucial, at least for critical incidents such as officer-involved shootings. Public interest in the video must be balanced against privacy, but the video is largely valuable because it allows the public to see what happened for themselves, assess whether officers have acted wrongfully, and judge whether the systems for holding officers accountable 
vulnerable or working or failing. Cameras can't promote trust if the department treats every video as if there's a reason to hide it. Third, cameras must not become tools for surveilling constitutional lawful activity. Video should be reviewed when there are complaints and randomly audited by supervisors, but the LAPD should not allow officers to go on fishing expeditions, for example, reviewing footage of demonstrations to create files on protesters, and officers should not have to fear that a supervisor who dislikes them will review hours of footage to find minor violations. Finally, with few possible exceptions, cameras must be on and required to record, record all interactions, and that requirement must be enforced. If officers can edit on the fly by turning off what they don't want recorded, cameras hold little value. With strong policies on these issues in place, and only then, will body cameras be a step forward for police accountability and trust? Thank you. Good. Thank you for your input. Hello, um, my name is Marion Sundy, and I live in South LA, and I have all the time I've lived here, the 20 years I've lived here, I'm also with the Freedom Socialist Party. And it's kind of, it's odd to come to a meeting to comment on cameras where you've already decided to set, spend $7 million um, that could be used elsewhere in this community. The swimming pool in my neighborhood at a community center that hasn't worked in six years, you could fix that. And that would do more for the kids in my neighborhood than body cameras on the police. The second thing I'd like to say is that the other half of the cameras is just another total surveillance awareness of the civilian population, which we don't need and we don't want. And I would like, to, it would have been nice to actually put it on the ballot, you know, when we, or give us a chance to vote on it, as opposed to what you said was 20 focus groups. That's democracy. Selected focus groups and emails to a thousand people asking if they want them. It's, why don't you just say you didn't consult and you bought them? This is like the iPads at the school district, in my opinion. And work about as well. I do think, though, it's important to note several people talked about accountability, which I believe in. This commission, in my history here, I can't remember that it has recommended prosecution of one police officer for murdering a civilian. Am I wrong? Has it recommended the prosecution of one police officer for excessive force against a civilian? You are not capable of holding the police accountable, and if accountability is the requirement here, then we need an independently elected civilian control board over this police department with the power to hire, fire, and discipline, and an independent prosecutor with the ability to independently subpoena witnesses with a separate independent staff. That will get you accountability, and it will answer what the gentleman who was shot in the back. It's not a question of treating you very much. talk Next. nice. I, everybody else had five seconds Next. extra, and, and I would be willing to talk to anyone about this later. We've tried it before. Thank you. Joseph Thomas, Mike Aguilar, Alani. Welcome, sir. First, sta uh, first statement. This is one of our biggest concerns. This technology as a police oversight mechanism will be undermined if the individual officers can manipulate what is taped and what isn't. For example, I don't know about anybody here, but from all of us from downtown, so you have a camera. Strategy says that 60% of the officers had the camera off when unarmed people were shot down. Now, the strategy also was turned over and it said that every week, 365 days a week, for the last seven years, two black individuals were shot. And this was given out by the FBI. And what I'm saying here today is, so you got cameras, but I want to put this on the table. Last year, before the year was out, 
Okay, somebody says they want to commit suicide, they're mentally ill, you're on, on Fifth and San Pedro, what happens? Did the officers come to save that person? No, they didn't. What did the officers do? If they had cameras, you wouldn't pick it up anyway because they called SWAT. What does SWAT have to do with the mental, mentally ill person that wants to commit suicide? SWAT came, they made the shot, and the man is no longer standing among us right now. You want us to trust you, but this is just another mechanism for genocide for all people of color. And that's just the way it is. You don't have to admit it. Nobody's going to, you know, tell them themselves. But this is the truth. So deal with that. When, when your name is called, can you please come stand up behind the next person? I'll just call three, so it won't be that long for you to stand. Mike Aguilar, Alani, and Devon Williams. Good evening, everyone. Welcome, sir. First of all, I would like to comment on the format that this so-called public hearing is taken. By not allowing any space in a similar fashion that you allowed your officer here to present, for the public to present any information about the potential use of cameras, the LAPD has stifled the free flow and access to information that the community should know before making an informed decision. This is offensive, but to be expected. Also, I don't feel safe surrounded by armed officers. Why don't they take seats and join us like they're, like they're a part of this community? There are seats open. All, you give me two minutes and expect me to believe that this is some sort of democratic process? No, this public hearing is a stunt created by the police for the police. And you say, just to say that you've completed your community obligations. My statement is no to body cameras, no to more police funding, no to putting a chokehold on taxpayer money and our city's budget. This is money, the community, this is the community's money, children's educational money. We need to invest in positive youth development at an equal amount to what the county spends to lock young people up. No to body cameras, adding to your mass system of surveillance that marks me as a criminal in your presence because I want to breathe freely and self-determine my own life and not that cop in my body of Highland Park with a shotgun cock to the back of my head. The camera project is a corporate scram between Laser International and LAPD and given that there is no civilian oversight as to the process of procuring or approving the use of body cameras, this public hearing is simply put a facade. In this search for truth and justice, we will not stop. Monica Harmon, Jamie Garcia, Elizabeth Thornton, Welcome. My name is Davon Williams. I'm a youth organizer with the Youth Justice Coalition. I am not in support of these cameras. I'm not in support because it is another way to build database of the public and not hold the police accountable for their actions. The, the public has no access to any of the footage at all, and these videos can also be manipulated, as well as the cameras can be turned off. So if the police were to shoot someone, they have no way to see, these, see this footage at all. There are many positive things that we can do with the money that is being spent on here, such as peace builders that come from our community. Um, youth centers and many other things that can uplift our community and not bring them down. Thank you. Thank you. So um, just before my public comment starts, I have uh, one of our friends, who, Alani Bonilla, who uh, needs just a few times, so if we can get her public comment just pushed back um, so that she can come up still and comment. Sure. If that's possible? Okay. Yeah. okay so uh, my name's Jamie Garcia. I have some uh, research that I wanted to give to you guys. It's our research on body cameras. We're not just going to ask the community to jump online. We know not everybody has access to computers. We've actually compiled it for you for ourselves, and we also have um, our uh, demands as far as uh, transformative uh, ways that LAPD can 
move themselves. So uh, again, I'm part of the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. It's comprised of individuals from diverse section of the community, including youth, artists, immigrants, formerly incarcerated folks, uh, academics, LGBT community members, um, and many more people. Since its formation in the summer of 2011, the coalition actively engages in publicly to expose the LAPD's programs of domestic surveillance, spying, and infiltration. The coalition believes these policies create a strong potential for violence against those considered suspicious. The community deserves real discussion regarding the root cause of police violence, not band-aid solutions like body cameras. We need public hearings on LAPD's technological surveillance programs that allow for extensive gathering of information, storage, and sharing of people's most intimate details and whereabouts without any type of criminal predicate. Trapwire gathers and stores facial images at rapid rates. Automatic license plate readers record and track where we go. Stingray gathers all of our telephone metadata. Suspicious activity reporting creates secret files on our use of photography, drawing, binoculars, videography, activity in public, and there is much more. These programs are kept secret and accessibility is regularly denied from independent public overview due to national security waivers. The impediments of true accountability are reinforced by the federal government and the LAPD. So now we're adding body cameras to this surveillance apparatus. Body cameras are a free pass for law enforcement to continue gathering of unlimited amounts of information on the public during encounters with law enforcement. These cameras fail to provide meaningful transparency, extend domestic spying, make mass incarceration even worse, and represent a budgetary bonus to police departments and corporate cam Thank camera you. contractors while distracting the debate Thank from you. more important issues of officer and okay, department so let accountability me ask you, let me for ask abusive you. patterns and practices. I'm trying to get a question out of this to us so I can add it to my list. Okay, so this is my question. This wait, is my no, question. Wait, I got your question. No, you so don't. You don't have my question. Your time is up, so let me do this, and then if you can answer it again, it's fine. Just give okay. me a chance. Go ahead. Shoot at Please it. give me a chance, okay? Go ahead. Because I've heard demands and stuff, but I want to mm -hmm. try and get a question out of it, okay? And it seems like you have a question of what is the definition of over-surveillance? When is it too much? When are the cameras too much, and how is that addressed in the policy? Is that is that a question that you're asking? Yeah, exactly, because okay. we see okay. this not only as a part, a continuing part of all the different apparatuses that I just talked about, okay. and the fact that they're secret, and the fact that they're not even being revealed to people like the ACLU, and that they're being uh, sanctioned by federal marshals, but how do we know how you're going to treat this information when it's being stored on evidence.com at a total of $4.5 million a year? Not only the $10 million is he going to give for the $7,000 dollar cameras, but $4.5 million. So what are you guys going to do with this data? We know biometric systems exist. They want to collect our face. They want to collect our fingerprints. They want to collect our voices. They want to okay, collect our Okay, I got your iris. question now. Thanks. Okay, so okay, I'm glad. I'm glad. Good and next. I also gave you our demands, and I also gave you our research. Monica Harmon, Elizabeth Thornton. Welcome. Thank you. The disrespect, the immaturity, there is a huge, look, there is a huge contingent of community, black community members who live in this area, who I have known for over 15 years, that can't come out because of these people who have threatened them, who have verbally assaulted them, who, pro who probably I will have to be escorted by one of these officers to my car because many of us believe in this. Surveillance is the way. Look what hackers are doing. You know, it's about time those cameras are turned around. The officers have these cameras in their faces. Let's turn those cameras around and show the public the assaults, the combative s suspects, what our officers have to go through for a time. And Tud Hayes, if you go on to YouTube, you can see hundreds of videos of officers being shot at and and suspects fighting to get their gun and that's you see I can't have my own opinion with these people they don't like it and the other thing is um, I think the cameras will modify behavior that's what we want to do we want to modify behavior and I agree with what you said when you put a camera in someone's face or they know a camera's on they behave differently but I for one the only way you're going to be able to speak in this room is at that microphone. 
You can speak outside, but if you're going to be in this room, you're going to speak at that microphone. Thank you. Next. And, Keep and lastly, because I have, lastly, there have been many incidents in the media where there is videotape of our officers seemingly perception doing something wrong. When the truth comes out and it's investigated and they show the whole video, not the part that was edited and submitted to the media, our officers are on the other end and they're innocent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Elizabeth Thornton. One moment, Elizabeth. Jody Chard, Wesley Walker, Jose Gallegos. Welcome. <laughs> I'm kind of ashamed to follow the slander that we just heard from someone who has worked with the LAPD for years. All right, but how, how here's my question. How will feeding more information into a system that is Wait, I'm broken... I'm sorry, I, I can't. Say it again. Say your question again. How will feeding more information into a system that is broken from top to bottom at all address those structural problems? And by broken from top to bottom, I mean several very specific things. Just last year, we found out dozens of officers in the Southeast Division have tampered with voice recording equipment, and the police commission, after a period of hemming and hawing, failed to initiate disciplinary procedures for a single one of those. And as we've just seen with that helpful demonstration, officers have control over whether things will be on and off, so tampering might not even be necessary. So now we're giving them more recording equipment to tamper with and turn on and off with impunity. Two, we know that body camera footage won't be obtained by Freedom of Information Act requests. That an official announcement has been made to that effect. In the same announcement, it was stated that the footage would only be available in conjunction with court proceedings. Does that mean the police commission won't even be able to take it into account during use of force investigations preceding an indictment in a court case? And even if they can take it into account, will it actually produce indictments? I mean, clear footage brought no justice to the family of Eric Garner, and LA has many Eric Garners. Since 2000, despite over 600 instances of lethal use of force, city officials have failed to indict a single officer to our knowledge. And you know, just this past week, the police commission manipulated footage of its own meeting. The video that's currently online of the Commission's January 6th meeting has no audio because they didn't like what they heard. Just search LAPD Commission Granicus to find that video. They posted another one, which was even more ridiculous before that, but it's been taken down. We're giving more expensive equipment for officers to tamper with, for officials to either Thank not you. have access to or to well, ignore as you, they continue to fail questions. to produce indictments. Let me ask you if I've got two of your questions right, because I'm writing down questions that we want to answer. Um, one of your questions is, what gives you the peace of mind that we will, imp in the policy, that uh, that that um, we will make findings on officers on the that make um, that are out of policy on the cameras because we didn't do it on the um, antenna deal. Is that one of your questions? Yeah. Will okay. You, so will let me ask another question. People? Okay. Let me ask another. And then another guidance? one of your questions is: um, Can the police commission? look at the video as part of the evidence while in our adjudication process? I think that's another one of your questions. Were there any other questions that you had that I missed? Are you going to censor this meeting too, like you did the other one, the recording and documentation of the other one? That's another one of my questions. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Um, thank you. Um, so, you know, to me, just kind of this parade, this freak clown show that you all have it, are having today, this is no surprise to me at all. Today you have showed, again, a total disregard and a disrespect for what people are saying here. Your arrogance is business as usual. The pigs all around here is actually how they function all the time. So let me begin with that. And also, you actually, you have not heard any of us who have said we do not want a policy around this. We do not want these body cameras. Um, with that said, you know, one of the things that I really want to point out here is the lack of transparency. Here we have a case where you have LAPD, the city, Taser International, and the LA Police Foundation all in bed with each other. 
in bed with each other. The facts, the facts are that Taser International, they donated 84,000 over three years to the LA Police Foundation. They also gave 80 stun guns in 2012 and 2013. It cost $82,000. The LA Police Foundation, they negotiated a contract for $1.5 million with Taser, Taser International. It's going to cost $4.2 million to put this footage on Taser's cloud database. This is absolutely unacceptable. I'm someone that has lived in Los Angeles that has worked with victims, victims of crimes, people that are low income. I work in a domestic violence shelter where people don't have access to housing. They don't have access to employment. They don't have food. You all are disgusting. Let's start with that. The city... Taser International, all of you, you all are lying. There's no transparency here about where these cameras, ca cameras came for, from, for what purpose. You should all be ash ashamed of yourselves. Please tell the truth, which you won't. Are you a line email? Yes, thank you. I was beaten by an officer in March 2012, and this beating was captured on video, a surveillance inside of a hospital. I was charged with resisting arrest, and I had to serve 17 days in LA County Jail for the lies that this officer told. The video evidence was excluded on the basis that it was prejudice against the officer. This is code, evidence code 352. The way that your officers are allowed to operate these cameras from their bodies watching us, recording us, hearing us, is not going to stand in court. All it does to serve is spy on us, to watch us. The video captured both my body and the officer's body, and it still was not allowed in court. I ask you to take a, a really deep thought into will these videos serve to protect us or serve to uh, protect the officers? I now have a federal lawsuit pending against this officer. And so I, I hope you take into consideration that this, all this money that's being invested could be invested into youth jobs, youth centers, education. This is millions of dollars just gone to waste. This is not going to hold in court. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Uh, my name is Wesley. And uh, I think this is something that's going to turn into a real nightmare for the people and for yourselves because you're, you're sitting up there now, you're playing God. God. And uh, I think 30% I think will not work for us. If, if we don't have 100% of what happened, I don't think those cameras can do that right now. This cam these cameras are really, really bad. And... and uh, I don't believe this is state approved as well. I think you should go through a legislation process, a voting process for these cameras because it's not right. Black lives matter, brown lives matter, all lives matter. And I, I, I would have to say that you should stop here in your tracks because of your, your uh, conflict of interest with uh, the people that's really making the money off of this. This is not the way to go, especially it's going to make you look bad in the end. So I would suggest that this is the idea that, that should be scrapped as of now because it will not work because you don't have a 180 degrees. Uh, uh, the police is watching us, but who's watching the police? Are you watching yourselves? You just can't sit over there and play God with our lives, because all lives matter in this room. Thank you. Kai Hichimi, Maritza Galvez, Kim McGill.
Welcome, sir. I'm, I'm with the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition. The more LAPD... Can somebody adjust the microphone for the gentleman, and then we'll start his two minutes again? What? I think it'll turn. I just need you to talk a little closer. The more LAPD officers commit brutality against young, unarmed, black and brown youth with impunity, over and over with impunity, the more these atrocities by police continue. They're rarely, rarely punished. I have a report put out by the Youth Justice Coalition. That report is by the LA County Coroner's Office. At least 599 people were killed by law enforcement in LA since 2000. Since from 2007 to 2014, of the 324 people killed, 98% were male, 82% were black and Latino, okay? And th there's a lot more uh, of that. Uh, there was a Rodney King case caught on video. We know the whole system, they moved, they moved the whole court system, the whole system, they moved the trial to a police-friendly area in Simi Valley, and they were feel, found not guilty. And everybody saw that on TV. Over and over, and this, the last, last month in December, all the protests in LA, that were part of the national protests against police killing unarmed black and brown youth. One protest in L.A. came up 7th Street. I just happened Thank to you, sir. see it. And Next. there were close to a 1,000 people, and a whole lot of those people were white. As they approached the corporate area and towards South okay, Park, thank you, sir. a whole caravan of police cars with sirens blazing came down. I went home and listened to... May we have the next speaker, please? I found now over Calvin. Maritza Galvez, Arrested. Kim McGill. This was an illegal protest. Why? I don't know. So your time's up, and you, you've agreed not to do this, and you're doing it. Does somebody else, one of the next ten speakers who's up, want to give their time to this gentleman? Nobody wants to give him their time? Sir, your time's up. Thank you, sir. Mr. Steve Starnoff, you mentioned that you've spoken to civic leaders, community leaders, that you've gotten so many approvals slash praises in regards to body camps. Wait, can you when put down? You it's hard for me to hear because the mic is... Okay, you can start over. Thank you. Okay, welcome. Mr. Steve Sarnoff, you mentioned that you've spoken to civic leaders, community leaders, that you've gotten so many approvals slash praises in regards to body camps. When did you speak to us, the community, the youth? When did you speak to the families who have lost loved ones thanks to police violence? You see, that's the problem. We've spoken to those families. We are the youth pulled over constantly, harassed by the police. And we live in the communities most directly impacted. We're the ones first there when a police officer shoots and kills an innocent human being. What's ironic about all of this is that none of the families have asked for cameras. The families that we've worked for, we've worked with, have actually completed a whole list of recommendations that do not include body cameras. The whole point of 
cameras is to create safety uh, slash accountability. How about you sit with the community? How about you sit with the families? How about you sit with the young people and the YJC and see this plan, see those recommendations? No to camera, cameras, yes to special prosecutorial units from the DA, yes to Kamala Harris independent assigned spe spe special prosecutors, yes to this list of recommendations made by those directly impacted. Thank you. Good evening. As Marissa mentioned, we've met with several families and worked with them on their cases, not just when the shooting first happened or at the forum that we had police come out and meet with the community, but through the long process of the court. And none of those families have asked for cameras. And our, our experience talking directly to the people in Ferguson is that it wasn't Mike Brown's family that came up with the ideas for cameras, but that it was planted for them um, by another agency. So I just want to make that clear. Secondly, the, the real recommendations that community has come up with have already been said, but I'm going to state them again. Push Jackie Lacey and and State Attorney General Kamala Harris to appoint a special prosecutor. So there really is an independent body looking into police use of force. Second, implement fully the recommendations made by family members about what they want for justice for themselves and their families. Um, third, uh, look at the other cities that have um, used real civilian oversight, not just in the United States but in other places, to make sure that civilian oversight here is real, with an independent subpoena power and the, about, and the power to discipline. Because we know you've already, based on your statements tonight, made a decision to go ahead with the cameras. At the very least, these, the cameras' footage has to be live streamed to an independent body to determine when the community should see footage, to determine what that footage and how it should be used in courts and, and in, in disciplinary procedures. Second, cameras, as, as many people have said, only show one view, the officer's view of us. It doesn't show the officer or their actions. So it already is a prejud prejudicial um, view. We have to have other forms of independent oversight to ensure that we get the whole story. And third, any failure to dismantle cameras or to fail to use them or to destroy cameras has to be followed up with strict discipline, including the firing of the officers. Finally, implement the 1%. The LAPD and LA City can always find money for more surveillance, for more equipment, for more police officers, but can never find the money that young people have been asking for for years for real youth development. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Thank you. My name is Jose Gallegos, the Youth Justice Coalition. Um, and I'm nervous. I'm real nervous. Just walking here into a community space, I feel very nervous. Why should I feel nervous entering a community space? You got over a dozen of police officers mad dogging, hand on their gun. I told you yesterday when we spoke. I used to think I was going to get killed by a community member, but it's sad to say I accept that, that one of these days I'm going to be the next Oscar Grant, Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown. It's sad to say that it's a, it's a list. It's a list that continues. It's sad that we only get two minutes to speak, but um, who are these cameras for? Who are they benefiting? Department of Los Angeles Police Department or the community? Um, I live at 323 West 77th Street in the heart of 77th Division. First, uh, we should be scared, you know, because we're forced to be locked up. When, when you go, it's probably a clause because you're a male Latino wearing a black shirt, brown pants, Cortez. I can't afford the fancy shoes and all that, you know? Two, um, damn. Now I'm scared to come out the house because I don't even want these cameras in my face right here. I'm scared to come out the house knowing that these cameras are going to be in my face. Now it's forced me to be locked in the house. We're already locked up, getting locked out the school system. Now we're getting locked in our own homes. How do we have trust with the police? I can't. When I'm intimidated walking like that, I would rather put trust in my comrade Abraham right here. Stand up. He's tatted up. I'm tatted up. So I recognize history credibility out here, you know? I know he comes from my community. We met yesterday, President. Sad to say that, when am I going to be number 605 on this list since 2000? I'm trying to be a part of the solution, not a part, of, a part of the problem, as I told you yesterday. Thank you, sir. Cindy Delgado, Cindy Delgado, Abraham, Kalinga, EZ, and Estefan Gill.
Welcome. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? My name is Cindy, and I'm from the Youth Justice Coalition, and I believe that you shouldn't waste your money on these cameras, like, because either way you're going to get rid of the, the investigations. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, rid of the investigations. Like, for example, Oscar Grant, it was caught on video, and he still haven't served no justice, and he was handcuffed. Um, Deonna Brewston, he was shot 81 times, caught on camera, still haven't served no justice. Alani was beaten. I, myself, was beaten in front of my daughter at that time. She was five months, and I was beating while I was handcuffed because I had fell asleep under the wheel, and my daughter was snatched by one arm by, by an officer, and she was taken to foster care, and I did not know where my daughter was at for a whole month. And through the help of YJC, I got my daughter now. Um, and instead of wasting your money with... Um, all these cameras, I think that you should um, support us, adopt a proposal for the 1% where you guys would donate 100 million and it would be enough for 50 youth centers, 500 peace intervention workers, as um, Jose and um, Abraham, and it would be 2,500 youth jobs where um, youth would be able to go spend, I mean, spend their time at work instead of being outside looking for trouble and 50 youth centers where, um, will keep us busy, where we would get educated, not being on in the streets, getting killed or beaten by polices. And I believe that these cameras are no use. You're just going to be wasting your money invested in something that's going to, um, better our community. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Um, good evening. My name is Abraham Kalunga. I'm a leader with the Youth Justice Coalition and organizer, peace building and intervention worker. And I would like to state for the record, it's not about if these cameras work or not. It's who really has control of them. I mean, now that I know that I'm going into voice recognition and face recognition, I mean, what is that, the next SAR, the next injunction for me? Instead of wasting money on LAPD tactics and making you richer, why not redirect 1% of the county funds to... 50 youth centers, 25 youth jobs, and please um, please meet with the Youth Justice Coalition that deals with the community to discuss a real solution. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Edzi, and um, I guess I have a few, oh, thank you. I guess I have a few questions. You can begin once he, once he, you can start over once he fixes the mic for you. Okay. So my question is, um, are body cameras going to uh, stop police state terrorism? Um, I, I ask because, you know, pretty much people, there's a lot of people who are very much afraid of the police. Um, and is it going to actually exponentially, body cameras on the police, is it going to exponentially increase uh, the surveillance state apparatus? Um, uh, if you're politically inclined, um, that's fascism. Uh, and um, I was wondering, you know, I mean, it's, it's interesting that this is supposed to be some sort of public forum, but you've all already decided on uh, buying, you know, 3,000 of these tasers that uh, the camera, once once the taser is deployed, that's when the camera goes on. And I'm like, I'm, I'm very confused with that because all they're going to see is somebody seizing up and then the police are going to say, oh, stop resisting, stop resisting as they're, as they're seizing. Um, so, yeah, I think this is a very interesting master narrative that's going on, um, considering we aren't getting to the root causes of the issue, and that's state-sanctioned violence. Our body camera is actually going to stop state-sanctioned violence, and if the police and the state are the ones who sanction that particular violence, is there ever going to be a, any sort of any sort of leeway, are people actually going to be listened to? Um, so my thing is, uh, I guess to end, you know, the, the remark about Mike Brown's family, this being their idea, I don't remember it that way. I remember uh, the father particularly saying, um, after he got news of the non-indictment to, uh, yeah, he, he declared, um, well, he said, let's burn this shit down. So that's all I can say. 
Welcome. Hi there, my name is Esteban. I'm a paralegal and a clerical worker out of uh, Silver Lake. And I just want to know why um, is is the, you know, if we're recognizing that there is a problem in America with police violence, why are we starting with a technological fix rather than when the fix needs to be, and that's from the top down? Um, what, for, furthermore, what is the relationship, you know, between this taser company and the LAPD? Uh, why them, and why out of nowhere uh, this body camera thing comes up? Was there a competitive bid process, whether where local contractors thought of, where people of color thought of in the in the business dealings of this. Why isn't the money being directed towards the community um, instead of towards this, this outside force? And finally, why has the commission, uh, folks have brought this up, acted like a rubber stamp body? Does the commission actually have any power or is it purely advisory? Because that's what it seems like to me. Um, I, I kind of think that this, this, this affair is a bit of a PR stunt. There is no amount of technology, there is no amount of resources going towards police departments that is going to solve the problem of state-sponsored violence. Uh, what, will serve, what it will serve to do is lower litigation costs for the department. And it will not hold officers accountable. Eric Garner uh, was murdered in broad daylight on, on, a, on a good quality video, and nothing happened. Uh, and I, I suspect that this is going to be the case with these body cameras. I, I, you know, others have echoed it before me, but if you want to combat crime, you know, when I screw up, I get fired. When the police department has a problem, they get money for it. This doesn't make sense to us and to a lot of people. Thank you. The, the final eight speakers are Hamad Khan, Mafia, Max Shorty, Tut Hayes, Salvador Herrera, Garado, Carmen Taylor Jones, and Thelma Perez. Welcome, sir. Hi, good evening. My name is uh, Hamid Khan with the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition. I think just echoing everybody, everything that is being said, what is really adding insult to injury is that as we're moving at warp spe speed ahead and getting new technology, whatever came out for the sabotaging of antennas that was busted and exposed were 90 patrol cars, their antennas was busted in for the in-car video camera and the voice monitoring equipment. I mean, you guys are moving forward. You have two lawyers on the commission as well, Kathleen Kim and, and Mr. Salzman. You have all the who's who. We have Eileen Decker sitting over here. You have Arif Ali Khan, who's done some, I don't know, legal consulting. You have Thalia Polycranus from the mayor's office and several of these people. What have you done to those officers? What has happened? Talking to the lawyers, I'm not a lawyer, but what I'm told is that that's called a conspiracy to, to commit a misdemeanor, which actually mounts up to a felony, where your officers intentionally sabotaged the antennas, broke those antennas, and nothing happened to them. How many people in the audience even know that? And how many people in the audience know that you already have an electronic surveillance apparatus from the high-definition cameras to automatic license plate readers to Stingray technology to trap wire technology to suspicious activity reporting program to Joint Terrorism Task Force to Joint Regional Intelligence Center, and we can go on and on and on. And we're fighting you on the drones. We're going to keep those grounded. And now you're going to just give us this new technology, which actually is not going to do much at all. Because even as the sergeant was showing that, the 130-degree view, it is only like what happens when somebody else said, then people get close. How do we know that how this thing is going to, how they're going to pull the gun out of that thing? How do they know that? And lastly, I think, more insulting is that, uh, first of all, ACLU is a law firm. They don't represent the community. When the community reaches out to you and wants to talk to you, you completely shut us out. We sent a letter asking that give us time to make a presentation. You talk about going and Googling stuff, we've given you actual research that is being cited and, and down to the wire. So that's all I have to say. The shame on you guys. Welcome, guys. Uh, good evening. My Speak name is right Carl. into the mic, huh? Oh, shit. 
Oh, shit. My, my name is Salvador, and uh, my friends Oscar, uh, we, we're speaking for all the youth in the city. We're speaking for all the teenagers that are here that are afraid to come out in the streets because we can't even hang out outside in front, in front of my house without even getting pulled over. Why? Because we're in a group of friends. I didn't come up here alone because we need somebody to back up us up. All these officers, they think because you have a hood, they're going to pull you over. They think you have a weapon. I've been running laps around the park, and I get pulled over. Why? Because I'm a suspect. My friend, my sister, and my friends crossing the street in front of my house got pulled over at gunpoint in front of me. I run, they put a gun on me too. What am I supposed to do? I thought the cops were supposed to protect us. Nah. Are these cameras, what are these going to help us? Are they going to put a disabled button on the gun? They still going to shoot. What are we supposed to do? I, mean, I thought this was a community meeting, not an officer meeting. Oh, no. I mean, I also speak from my, all my Latin culture. We, there's been a lot of Latin cases of people that don't even speak up. Why? Because they're afraid of getting any immigration problems. Why? Because they don't want to get deported. I'm speaking up for all of them, for my parents, for many of my friends' parents. I'm speaking for all of them, for all the teenagers in this community. That's all we have to say. Thank you for coming. Uh, welcome, sir. I'm Max Shorty, and I'm the vice chair of the Watson Neighborhood Council. I received one of those inquiries about the body camera. I responded. This is my police captain in my area. Him and I don't always agree with each other, but at the end of the day, we have a working relationship. But we still disagree, but I still respect him as a man. I have lost a relative to an officer-involved shooting. The amount of money can never replace our loved one. But at the end of the day, if we could give that money back so that he could still be here with us, we would. What we all need to do here is work on human relationship. You give respect, you get respect. My pastor in church taught me as a minister, in order to have friends, you must show yourself to be friendly. This is my friend. We still disagree, but he's still my friend at the end of the day. We can sit here and badger them all day long. As a city, we have paid out hundreds of millions of dollars to people's loved ones. And now's the time we can bring about change. And it's a shame that a lot of people in this room is not in agreement for change. If Martin Luther King was here today, I think he would be in agreement for change. You know, you can say whatever you want to say, but it's about human relationship. And if Big Brother's a part of human relationship, so be it. So that's all I have to say. I'm in support of the body cameras, and I'm the vice chair of the Watson Neighborhood Council. Next. Todd Hayes. Are we done? How many more do we How have? How many more speakers? One, two, three, four, five. Five. Five, Todd. five more. Tud Hayes, Salvador Herrera. Okay, my name is Loretta Tucker, and I want to say to all of you and all of you back here, Martin Luther King and Cesar Chavez said, do it peacefully. Let's have some peace around here. Let's all of us work together to get this done peacefully. Thank you. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Hayes, sir. Thank you. Uh, you know what? I must have said something very reasonable because Commission, uh, President Subarov said, I saw reenactments, I saw videos, and that's what convinced me. Isn't that what I said? <laughs> Show us the videos. Do a reenactment. Convince us. Well, he's convinced. Can we be convinced too? Can we something, see something similar to what you saw that made you so adamantly convinced that Bible cameras are okay? If you recognize that was an interesting piece of information, Provide us with it, please. Now, before there were cameras or tape recorders, there was paper. A paper trail is what they called it. I refused to sign a jaywalking ticket, and the police took me in. State law requires when a person doesn't sign a citation, they must be taken directly before a judge. They took me to jail. 77th Street. You cannot find any piece of paper that the police will provide showing I was ever in jail. When you 
my age, you go to jail, you must be examined by a doctor. I went to the place this repository for that paper. The paper doesn't exist. They never saw me. Then the next morning, they took me to the Wall Street traffic court. The sheriff says, we have no record of you ever being here. But my problem is I passed out in the cell, and the paramedics came and took me to the hospital. No paperwork throwing this to place. Now, if we can't control the paper, which has been here forever, how can we trust you with the cameras? You don't take care of the papers. You can deny that a person ever existed in your system. Right now, it's been a year now, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Silveroff, an entire year, and nowhere can I find anyone who will say I was taken to jail. They, the doctor said, this guy is old. Either you feed him or you release him. Well, they can't feed me because they got no teeth and I have no saliva. Okay? So I can't eat a burrito unless somebody's got the Heimlich. So I need, I need to know, do you really think a person like myself, who is intimately involved with the police department, information-wise, can trust you with tapes when we can't trust you with paper? Something simple, something that the state of California requires, and you will not do it. Next. Hi, welcome. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Carmen Taylor Jones, and I am the uh, regional homeless count coordinator for SPA 6, which is South Los Angeles. Over the 27th, 28th, and 29th of this month, January, the Los Angeles Housing Services Authority will be conducting the Greater Los Angeles Homeless Count for 2015. On the evening of January 29th, South Los Angeles, this area that we're in right now, SPA 6, will have over 12 hundred volunteer counters that will start at eight o'clock and work until midnight walking through the street counting our homeless men women and children we need the um, community to be aware that we are going to be out to be on the lookout for us and also law enforcement that every last one of our uh, volunteer counters return home safely that evening thank you very much if you are interested in volunteering or registering as a volunteer you can go on to the website which is w www.theycountwillyou.org, or you may see me for a paper registration form. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carmen. That's the final speaker, Mr. President. I didn't hear what you said. That's the final speaker. Your name? I called you. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Speak. First of all, Steve, when we first started this, um, our elder came up and gave you a good um, example of uh, two different types of schools. And when you said, oh, you know, mister, I looked at it online, you should go up and look at it. That's a disrespect to our elders because they take their time to come to a community event and listen. And so for you to treat our elder like that, it's a disrespect to, to us and to the community. So I hope you can... Mr. Apologize. Hayes knows how much I that, respect that, That's him, one so. thing. Another thing, if you're talking about transparency, we don't need body cameras to be transparency. ESO 4 was shot in the back, and we have autopsy to show that, and we have police who were, instead of being, like, fired, they got placed on administrative leave, and now they're working on the city desk on 77 Newton. How is that justice? How is how are you trying to tell us to be transparency, and you gave up a whole this whole demonstration on body cameras to say that, hey, Community, can you come up and, and this is what we're trying to do. We don't need body cameras to show you how the police have acted several years. So if for us, if you want to be transparency, you should listen to the videos that have been on YouTube show you the misconduct of police. And instead of us getting justice and the families getting justice, they get cops being put on administrative leave getting paid for that. So for us, and another thing, it's a disrespect for you to have a community event when the decision has already been made. So how, how is that transparent when you're trying to take our time to listen to you and the decision has already been made? So that is total disrespect. So oh, unless you're going to tell us when the decision is going to be made and that place is like maybe on the sports arena so it can be public so that the city of LA can go and listen to that and you guys can take a whole 
yay or nay vote, and then that way the city can decide if we can allow to do that. That's a question. If you guys want to be transparency, I would. My proposal is to have the, the decision be put on sports arena. Thank you, sir. On the sports arena, and then you guys decide Next. by letting us decide what what road to take. Next. But I hope you can apologize to our elder here, please. He's my friend. Good evening. My name is Thelmi Perez. Um, it is our moral obligation to disobey unjust laws. Rest in peace, Dr. King, who, by the way, was surveilled by the FBI and, act, and asked to commit suicide, actually blackmailed into committing suicide because of surveillance. So we are, as um, Reverend Max Shorty said, we are living in Orwellian times. And big brother Charlie Beck has a new tool at his disposal to surveil us to surveil us when we're engaging in legal, peaceful activities, like protests. It's a shame, actually, that we are having, as, as, and I echo what so many people said already, that we're having this, this meeting here, which is a farce. You're not actually taking us into account. You've already made a decision, right? So how much more money will you continue to siphon from the public coffers? How much more money when we're living in a city where 80% of the poorest city or of the poorest residents of this city cannot afford their rent, are paying more than half of their incomes towards rent. Yet here we are, just spending all the money that we can so that you can have more tools to surveil us, to keep the poor at bay, to keep us from demanding what we should have, a quality of life. So people also talked about having a working relationship with the LAPD. This is not working for the community. It's not working for the community. It is not working for the community. I just want to say that we need public hearings for your mass surveillance, surveillance programs. You want to work with the community, you should listen to the community. We need programs to be public, to be transparent, and to be exposed. When you say that these cameras can turn on 30 second buffer before you even turn them on, that's dangerous. When you say you can only get this video surveillance on a need to know, right to know, well, we need to know how you're surveilling us, how you're monitoring us, and there's already Thank plenty you. of programs that you have not Thank been you. transparent about, like Thanks. the SARS program. That's what we need for our community. Uh, before the next speaker, let me say something here. Um, this, let me just read from the calling of this meeting. Just a second. Okay, okay, that's fine. We can use the translator. Hold on for a second. This meeting was called, it, it says, soon LAPD officers will be equipped with on-body cameras. As the policy is now being developed as to how and when the cameras and videos will be used and accessed, now is the time to provide your input into the process on the policy. This meeting was advertised to do what we're doing. This was not a meeting to vote on whether or not there were cameras. Next up. Next up. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a city council issue. Do you need a translator, sir? Yes, sir. Sir, do you need a translator? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to translate for him? Do you have any translator for him? Uh, we, we do. We should have the translator in the room. Is yeah. the Spanish translator still in the room? She's stepping forward. Just one second, please. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, people. Buenas noches. Good evening. Welcome, sir. My name is Salvador Herrera. The only thing I'm surprised is because I don't see my community here. In that area, I only see LAPD people that you know. From this side, I only see organizations that I have never heard of before, and I'm just getting to know them today. La única persona que vi que era de mi comunidad la sacaron en cupones afuera. The only person that I have seen that is from my community is someone that I was pushed out of here. Tú lo viste, el avión. You saw it, right? Yes. Yo nomás digo, está bien, las cámaras está bien. So I am just saying that the cameras are okay, but. Que las usen cuando es debido, no para nada más conveniencia de ellos. 
but it, the cameras are okay, but I just want you to use it when it's correct, not when it's convenient to you. I have an incident in which the uh, patrol car uh, recorded this. We asked him to show us a video, but he refused to do that. I asked him, why? Why can you not show this? And I said, because I am LAPD and I cannot show you anything. That's all I wanted to show. Thank you, sir. Uh, that's all I wanted to say is like, please, if you can behave be better with the people. Thank you. That concludes the com public comment period. Okay, so now we're going to um, now we're going to move on. I'd like to ask um, uh, Maggie Goodrich to come up and Dan Gomez to come up. We have heard, um, we have written down um, questions regarding the policy that people have asked. Um, I've written some down, other commissioners have written some down, so let us, I'm sorry, Richard? I've got them, I've got them all, sir. Okay, uh, Mr. Tfank has, has uh, written down those questions. So, yeah, also, Arif Alarcon will come up. So now let us um, attempt to answer some of the questions that you have asked. Um, Mr. T, uh, do you want to read it? And then sure, I'll, 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 bring I'll, I'll, I'll read okay. what I have, sir. I think okay, I've go ahead. Uh, speak into the microphone, sir. Yes. I think I've captured them copiously, but I could be wrong. The, uh, the first question was, will the public get access in time to the videos? Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is R.F. Ali Khan. Speak I'm right into the mic so we can hear you, too. Okay. All right. Uh, my name is Arif Ali Khan. I'm the Special Assistant for Constitutional Policing at the Los Angeles Police Department. I'm not a police officer, I'm a civilian, and I help uh, the department in developing policies. Uh, the question, as you heard, was whether the public will get access to video. Um, there are certain laws that regulate when uh, video and other inf information is captured by the police, whether it's in-car video or other recordings. Um, in certain circumstances, that information is released to the public, but generally, that is not the case. The intention, as the chief mentioned, is for police officers to be able to uh, film or record interactions with the public during law enforcement activities. Those are generally protect protected. However, uh, those the police commission has access to that information to review it to see if there's been misconduct, obviously internal affairs, and then in certain types of litigation and lawsuits, that information has to be uh, produced. It will be, all of the recordings are preserved for minimum of two years, um, so they'll always be available um, when when there's some lawful need to produce the, the uh, information and uh, be viewed by the appropriate folks. I think that also answers the, the second part of the question, which was, will a family member get access to the video? I believe Mr. Alakam with his answer uh, covered that part. The second is, uh, is the camera able to be dis disabled uh, or when an officer does not activate it, what will happen to the officer? So the camera itself is, uh, once it's turned on, as I mentioned, you see this orange um, indicator light that shows that the system is actually powered on. Um, certainly it is a device. If you throw it hard enough up against a wall, it will break. However, then a supervisor knows that in fact it's broken. As I mentioned, each camera is assigned to a particular officer. If that camera comes up broken, if there's some issue with the camera, we can attribute it directly back to that officer and take any appropriate action as according to the policy. But Anybody who has a cell phone, anybody who has any kind of electronic device, they're always subject to breaking. What we've picked is the, the best camera that we think is on the market, that is the most durable, but again, it is an electronic piece of equipment. So unfortunately, there's no specific way for me to answer that, other than we did the, the best and the due diligence to make sure that we were picking a camera that was as durable as we could that's on the marketplace. Next question. Will, will the cameras be used for other type of things to surveil people or to watch people in a covert way? Uh, 
Um, as the chief mentioned, the idea with the on-body cameras is they'll be visible, they'll be on the police officers as seen. Um, with the officers, uh, in many cases, will advise people that they're being recorded because as one of the objectives of having the video is to deter bad behavior by people the officers are interacting with and to always uh, maintain the ability to make sure the police officers are acting in a professional and lawful manner. Next <clears throat> Let us go through these questions, and then if there's a clarification, go ahead, Mr. Tifank. The next question were a series of questions from the representative from the ACLU, and uh, I'll, I'll summarize these questions. I believe I have them correctly. Uh, their belief is that the officers should not be able to view the video prior to uh, being interviewed or making any report as related to an officer-involved shooting or any other critical incident. No, 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 we're no, not no, asking no. you. We, we, we that want that to was a question you asked, and we're going to respond to it. If you, if you wouldn't interrupt your other people that are talking, yeah, you are. So let's go ahead, Maggie. Hi, Maggie Goodrich. I'm the CIO for the LAPD. The uh, policy for body worn has not been finalized at this point, so we can't speak to exactly what will be in that. That's the reason we're holding the community meeting um, at this point. So I, I don't know that we can speak to what's in the, the final policy as we haven't started meeting confer okay. or completed the community feedback. Yeah. Someone mentioned something about evidence.com. Would you stand up and clarify that? Your question. I, I, I don't know if Sergeant Gomez or Maggie is the appropriate person, but could you explain evidence.com and how that yeah. works and, and the purpose of it and the. Uh, so, evidence.com is a cloud based storage uh, solution. The, that is an off-site location that is not located in the city of Los Angeles, nor in direct control of the Los Angeles Police Department, although they have to comply with rules and regulations that we set forth in terms of access and control, accessibility, all those items that we would require for any system, whether it's on-premise, meaning it's in our data center, or whether it's off-site at someone else's data center. This is a common practice amongst uh, um, large corporations, against, uh, like I said, even for you who have any kind of smart devices and store your um, personal information into the cloud. Again, it's a, it's a way of doing storage. Evidence.com, because it's for law enforcement only, when we upload it, it our data is not commingled with any other data. It is only information specifically from the Los Angeles Police Department. It is secured, and it, the data does not belong to uh, Taser. It belongs to the Los Angeles Police Department and is property of the Los Angeles Police Department. Mr. Tfank, next question. The next question uh, or comment from the representative of the ACLU was, I think we already answered it, public access to the video. I believe that was already answered. The next was, um, uh, I think we've already answered it also, tools for surveillance, um, a fishing expedition. I believe that's already been answered by your previous uh, responses. The, uh, the next is, uh, will the cameras recall, record all interactions? As you know, the LAPD already has cameras in uh, cars in South Bureau, and there is a requirement that those cameras are activated whenever there's a law enforcement activity um, and interaction with the public. Um, that is what's being contemplated for this policy, um, and and as, as the representative from the ACLU knows, and we've had discussions, we are looking at the precise situations where they'd be uh, recorded, but the idea is to make sure that when a police officer interacts with a member of the public, when they're uh, doing 
a law enforcement activity, that that information is recorded, that that information is uh, tamper-proof in the device, and that information can be reviewed to make sure uh, that evidence that might need to be used later on for a criminal prosecution, um, against, if let's say it's an arrest, or to investigate whether there was any misconduct preserved and has the integrity so we can get to the truth. The uh, next question, Mr. Tifang. <coughs> Why don't you let him finish, because it is one of the questions, if you would let him finish. Thank you. So you're right, the, uh, as I mentioned before, the lens has a 130 degree angle. That's the maximum amount of lens that uh, we can use on a body. Um, because again, there's the quality of the picture. There's Once you get beyond a certain point, you start to distort the video because again, it starts to bend excessively. So you actually lose some of the details that of course we want in any part of investigation. The other part I would add is that um, as uh, Mr. Alicon um, uh, just mentioned, not only do we have the in-car video cameras, but we also have multiple officers responding to a scene. So those officers all have their video cameras on. So now what you have are multiple angles of the same incident. All the video is then considered as part of the overall investigation. So again, it's not just the one that's being, it's but the, the partner officer and all the officers that respond. The cumulative effect of all those cameras is what goes in ultimately to the investigation. Next question, Mr. Tifang. Next Will you let us finish the questions that we think you've asked, and if you feel that we missed your question without screaming from the back of the room, I will ask you if we didn't answer your question. Is that okay with you? Yes, sir. Mr. Tifank. The next question was, can... Okay, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to end this meeting. Yeah. Ma'am, I didn't interrupt you. Please don't interrupt me as I'm asking the questions. Sergeant Gomez, it's the can last the data warning. be manipulated? The last warning. Can the data be manipulated by the officer? So no, the data is again protected from inside the camera. It's sealed as it uploads. It has to do that authentication process that I um, described earlier. Once it's into evidence.com, the officers don't have direct access to the video where manipulation could take place. It is secure, it is off-site. The officers only have the rights to review it. They can't record it, they can't manipulate it, they can't do anything to the video. Um, again, when it transfers from the device into the system, it has a very specific security code, any alteration or deletion to that video then would be discoverable and that would be against department policy um, so certainly uh, we would be able to detect that either through our own investigation or through an independent investigation. Next question Mr. Tifan. The second part of that question if any officer is found to have damaged a, a device tampered with a device such as examples were given in the prior Southeast Santana what will be the ramifications of that? And I'll answer that and if we can attach the damage to an individual officer, that officer will receive discipline. That discipline could be up and including firing. The next question, uh, the next question is, uh, will the police commission be able to view... Wait, wait, let's back up. Hold on. The second part of that question really wasn't answered. And the second part of that question is, so if that's the case, then what was the difference in what happened with the antennas? I think that was the second part the of the question. The answer to that question is that we couldn't attach that action to any specific individual. It occurred over several years' time, and it did not degrade the performance of the system, so it was impossible to attach to any individual. Thank you. Next question, Mr. T. Fank. Will the police commission be able to view the video captured and use of force incidents as they adjudicate cases? Officer-involved shootings are investigated by the LAPD as well as the Inspector General and the DA's office. Part of that investigation will include the video that's captured as it is today when video is captured. Um, with on-body camera, there will be if there will be multiple videos. All of that information is, is put together, and as with all of the investigation that's done by the LAPD, uh, when the police commission makes a determination of whether the, the shooting or other use of force was uh, within policy, they will have access and be able to review any of the video and will do so in making their determination. Can the uh, video data be streamed live to any outside entity to review? 
So the system as designed that we're purchasing does not have that capability. It cannot stream um, directly from the device. As I mentioned, there is no cellular connection in this particular device. There's nothing in this device that allow it to stream outside of just recording it and then taking it back to the station to upload. There was also a comment related to when a taser is activated, will it activate the camera? So that was a widely reported um, information that went out through the media. It's actually incorrect and was corrected by several news organizations. There are two different systems. So the Taser device is a completely different system. It does not send any signal. That capability does not exist today, where by activating a handheld Taser device, would it activate the body-worn camera? Unfortunately, that was just misinformation that was put out. Next question. Mr. Tifang. Yes. The next question was, um, will the, uh, the body cameras uh, stop police state terrorism? Well, I don't know if that's a policy question. That's a I don't believe it is, sir, but that was a question I wanted to The next question. Okay, very good. Uh, the, uh, the next question was, uh, a significant amount of time was spent on why taser? I think Sergeant Gomez talked about that at the front, but maybe again, the field test that was done and why taser was a selected vendor. W was there a competitive process? Mag I think Maggie... You want to talk about the competitive process? Uh, sure. So actually, before we started the field test uh, about a year ago, um, we spent about almost four years actually researching the technology, looking at various vendors that are out there, evaluating different solutions, um, and we were able to narrow it down to two that had a total solution, which means not only a camera, because there are a lot of cameras out there, but also offered a storage solution, a way to do a one-to-one -one transfer to verify that the entire original video was being transferred, track chain of custody, track access, and, and have a full audit log so that we know who took that video, who uploaded it, who's access it, who's viewed it, etc. Um, we narrowed it down to those two that could do all of those things that I just described. We did a field test of each of those two for 90 days with officers in Central Division um, in the Safer Cities Initiative. We received feedback from those officers. We also did technical comparisons of those uh, in similar situations, so low light situations, that type of thing, to see how each camera reacted. Um, based on the feedback we received and the results that came out of that testing, we identified identified Taser as the preferred vendor. Thank you. Mr. Um, that, that concludes the questions that were asked that okay, are relevant so, to the uh, policy, sir. Uh, sir, the, sir, the guy with a sign in the back? No, excuse me. The gentleman with a sign in the back? Will you come up to the microphone? You seemed extremely anxious to ask a question, and I want to make sure that you can do that. Well, the thing about this is, what about the antennas? There's nothing been shown. Okay, we Where? talked. We talked about that. We answered okay, the question, next. sir. Okay, so let me talk about let me talk about the future now. What's going to happen? Okay, let me talk to the future about it. If you have additional questions or comments that you think we should be answered, the web is working all night, all day tomorrow, and all over the weekend. You have an opportunity to do that. Also. Tomorrow, you can email the commission office, you can call the commission office. Also, tomorrow we have another meeting just like this one. You can attend the other meeting. And let me uh, finish by saying to uh, my friend Mr. Hayes, if I offended you by saying that I had looked on the internet at those things, I apologize, sir, and I'm happy to uh, chat about that next time we have lunch. Thank you. I'm Jen Mahoney in Studio City. You're watching LA City View Channel 35, where you can get the best in culture and arts. It's our city, it's our channel. Hey, just go! Hello, welcome to Connie Martinson Talks Books. We've heard that 9-11 was a wake-up call. Well, fine, it woke us up, but what did we see and what did we wake up to? My guest today, Larry Elder, has written Showdown, 
confronting bias, lies, and the special interests that divide America. It's published by St. Martin's Press. Welcome, Larry. Hi, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, and your book is the sort of book you will come across a paragraph, and you don't have to worry what your family's going to talk about at dinner because it is a very provocative book. Oh, thank you. I was just saying, Connie, the only thing more dangerous than an interviewer who's not read the book is one who has. Okay. <laughs> so consider me a danger yes, follicular. You're, you're in the second category. Right. But this is a book that looks at beginning with race and hate and envy. Mm -hmm. Now, we're a country that is economically becoming far separated from what used to be the middle class. You take exception to Roosevelt and the New Deal and what you call the progressive